Well, good morning, Mountainside family. How are we doing this morning? Doing great. Would you stand with us as we begin our morning singing God of Calvary? Good morning. It's good to have you here. And if you're a guest this morning, we welcome you. And as I look around, there's people who uh, are 
are here all the time through the year and our snowbirds and then our summer people and then our one or two week people and then the people that are just passing through and so we just would love to connect with you, love to meet you, hear your story. We hope that today will be a blessing and that God will speak to you and that you'll walk away uh, having been touched not just by the friendliness and the exchange with people, but uh, that God will speak to you this morning and uh, will encourage you as you uh, journey through life. A um, lot of challenges in our family, um, church family. We have uh, Ellie Winters, who's been in the hospital and uh, uh, not sure what's going on as they try to diagnose the problem, but it's, it's a significant thing we need to pray for. And then this past week, Paul Bubar. Um, had a uh, blood aneurysm or blood clot or blood clot in his brain, and uh, he's having some complications. And his daughter Sarah's getting married today, so you know it's the, the way life happens at times. And so we need to be praying for them. And uh, when we come to the offering, we'll we'll pray for them as well. Um, a couple announcements. One is we're going to be starting a uh, small uh, group. Bible study, book study. We're going to study William Lane Craig's book, On Guard, and Matt Kern is going to be leading that. It's an apologetic book, and it will help you to understand uh, worldviews and understand how to defend your faith. We want to keep the group fairly small, so if you want to see Matt um, after the service or, my, or myself, it's going to start at 8.30, um, like two Sunday mornings a month, and uh, we'll go through that book. So... Uh, let us know if, you want, if you're interested and want to be a part of that, and we'll make room for you. And then we're going to start a, a few more things in the fall, and you'll hear more about that. There's also an opportunity to serve our community. Liz Parsons is uh, going to be putting together school supplies for children in our community, and uh, she's been getting the list from the teachers and assembling them. You can go out to the foyer and get information on the table. You can get on Facebook, on the Mountainside family, and get information. Um, it's things like three-ring binders and composition notebooks and those kinds of things. And they'll be collected over the first few weeks of August, and then they'll be distributed the last week of August. Also, very exciting, last Sunday after the service, we had our business meeting, and the vote was unanimous to begin the uh, Youth Center project. And so uh, already some money has come in. And uh, we're ready to get, to get going. And so we'd love to see how much we could get done. I would love to see how much we could get. Usually when I think of what needs to be done, the guys who know what needs to be done always correct me. Because how long would it take to paint, you know, uh, four classrooms and hallways? And so anyway, uh, we'll let you know, keep you informed with the timetable. But, you know, we're starting our uh, ministries in the fall. And then as the... Uh, winter months begin, we also want to start uh, ministering to our community in, by using that building as well. So we want to see how far we can get, how deep we can get, and it depends on us raising the funds. We still have a little bit of money left over from, from our building fund after we've completed the, the uh, sealing up of the downstairs. Um, and it's important that as you give, and you can give online to the building fund, that it not interrupt our uh, regular giving because you got to have a church to have a youth center. And so as you give, let it be your over and above giving. And we'll talk more about that as well. Our deacons meet a week from this Tuesday. And we'll, do, we'll try to make as much progress as we can in laying out that plan before you. Uh, we also have a treat, uh, Linnell Smith. And could you get the mic in the clicker? Is the clicker back up there? Okay. Um, Linnell Smith is missionary. We've been supporting her for... 28 years, right? 28 years. Um, 17 years in Brazil, if I remember right. And then now, then she went to uh, Ecuador and served with another, I guess I'm giving your presentation. But uh, <laughs> so she had to learn Spanish. And now she's ministering to multiple countries. And part of what allows her to do that is, is your faithful support. So don't forget supporting our missionaries. And I think this is going to be Missionary Month. We we have tried to get missionaries on the same Sunday. Never seems to work with the, with the way air travel is and, and the cycles of missionaries. And so I think just about every Sunday this month, we may have a missionary uh, in front of you. And so, Linnell, why don't you 
bring us up to date with your ministry. Thank you, Pastor Dave, and thank you for your faithful partnership in ministry for these 28 years and counting. Yes, it has been an adventurous journey um, to Brazil and Ecuador and beyond other places. But my journey started as growing up in a Christian home, for which I thank God for, in Iowa, and trusting Christ at the age of seven. Then God led me and grew me as he showed me I needed to be obedient to him. And my life was Samuel 12, 24, only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things he has done for you. Well, the Lord led my parents to move from Iowa to Scroon Lake, New York, while I was in college. And I joined them a couple years later. So that was in 1988 and have been a part of Mountainside. And I worked for Word of Life for a couple of years, knowing God had led me into missions. And I went out with the Association of Baptists for World Evangelism to be a member of the church multiplication team. Our vision to fulfill the Great Commission by multiplying leaders, churches, and missions movements among every people to the glory of God. And you have them through children's ministries, being the ch children's ministry director of the church plant in Kumbaya, Ecuador, for six years. And then in this past term, which has been five years since I was able to come and share with you what God is doing face to face, God allowed me to have the privilege of going up into the northern highlands of Ecuador to at least reach people group and partnering with the Quechua church there, as well as some other missionaries, to teach the word of God to children and train them to teach children the word of God. Other opportunities for evangelism have been with earthquake disaster relief as Ecuador was hit with a major earthquake in 2016. And that also allowed discipleship, hosting student mission interns, along with my nephew, um, Matthew Smith's uh, oldest son, and going on Wheels for the World trips as an interpreter, but also taking Ecuadorians with us to be partners in the ministry of reaching another least reached people group, people with disabilities in northern Peru. Every week that we would be there, there was four different trips those years, we would hand out and distribute anywhere from 175 to 200 wheelchairs and have the opportunity to share the gospel on an average with over 300 people each week. What a blessing that was. Okay. It stopped. But in this last term, one of the neatest things is how God has pushed me out of my comfort zone with children and allowed me to be a part of a teaching team that has gone to equip others to do the work of the ministry. As Ephesians talks about in Ephesians 4, to use our spiritual gifts for the building up of the body of Christ. And God has allowed me to do that using Moving Beyond Lecture, which is a module which models and instructs how to teach adults effectively um, in an interactive way and training them. Over 300 participants in 14 churches and five um, countries have been involved in that training, including the Kichwa Bible Institute instructors, so that they can teach the word. That has also led to being involved with the Good Soil Evangelism and Discipleship, with providing resources and helping to tr um, coordinate um, translation projects and teaching Good Soil Evangelism and Discipleship Seminars, where we equip people to be able to share the gospel in a culturally worldview-relevant way that helps them to clearly understand and embrace the gospel. But one of the key things with that 
is that that has been in many countries, and now they can teach it to their own people. <laughs> but one of the greatest privileges God has given me is to learn and grow and take these courses for women-to-women -women ministry training to learn to do group discipleship with the women and train them to be leaders in their local church. I had the opportunity to co-facilitate one of these courses in Ecuador this last term, actually the last semester before coming home, and it was with 11 ladies from five different churches meeting in our house, my house, for 10 weeks. Each week we studied and prayed together and they learned Bible storying and small group dis discussion leading. What a blessing it was as they have been now challenged by God to go and back to their churches and do the same in their um, local church ministry. God is providing and he's multiplying leaders for the harvest. Thank you for your part of that. And if you'd like to know more, you can see me afterwards and sign up for my ministry update list, um, email, regular mail, and Facebook. Thank you. We'll ask the ushers to come forward. Let's pray for Lynette and for Ellie and for Paul and for our offering. Father, we are so thankful to be a, your children, to be a part of a community of believers Thank you for Lynette for her faithfulness over these 28 years. I thank you for the, the privilege of being a part of her ministry. Father, we pray you would bless her, give her a rest and recuperation in this uh, uh, furlough after a very long uh, time of service. Uh, pray that uh, as she goes back, you would just even increase her fruitfulness. Um, and uh, we, just, uh, we just pray that you would continue to protect her and uh, continue to bless her and continue to give her multiplied opportunities. Father, we pray for Ellie. Pray for the doctors to get uh, to be able to uh, resolve exactly what is causing her temperature and all the things that are going on. And for Herb as he ministers to her and uh, just give them strength and wisdom. Father, for the Boober family, uh, for the wedding today uh, and the... the uh, burden that that is on everyone. The, the, we just pray for comfort, for strength. Father, we pray for healing for Paul, for the doctors to have wisdom in being able to treat him. Um, we just pray for them, and, and you know exactly the way to meet each need. Father, for our ministry, we pray uh, that you would uh, continue to, to bless with the giving of the people to, for the uh, functioning of this ministry for all of the moving parts that need to be supplied uh, from electricity to salaries to uh, just keeping ministries going, even getting ready for the fall with our, with our children's ministries. Father, we pray for our, our uh, remodeling project, that you would go before us, that you would raise up money, uh, that you would do things in a, uh, in a way that would cause us to marvel and be able to give no credit to anyone but you. And we just uh, ask for you to lead us and guide the leaders in, in making those decisions. So take what we give today. May you be blessed by our giving. May you give wisdom to those who oversee the giving. May you multiply the effectiveness of the gift. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Don't 
tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the finest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is for As we continue to sing, uh, feel free, you can stay seated if you'd like, uh, or if you'd like to stand, either one is fine. Let's continue to worship our Lord at the cross.
Father, what a privilege it is to come into your house, to praise your name, lift you high. God, we thank you that though our sin is great, that your mercy is greater. Father, that what you did on the cross stamps approval on us. God, you love us so much with a, a love that is unfailing. And I pray that this morning that we would, that we would just be so amazed by that love, that we would rest in that love, that we would 
stop striving and, and trying to, to work to earn favor because we've already got all the favor in the world that we could ever have from you. God, we love you. I pray that today, uh, as we look into your word, that you would transform our hearts, that you would make us more into the image of Jesus so that we could be glorifying and honoring to you and be a light to this community. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, it was revealed to me that I kept calling Linnell Lynette. And I have a really close friend who's Lynette. And so last night we had Linnell, and I guess tonight, we, this morning we had Lin. Forget, I'm not going to even try to, I'll get it mixed up again. Anyway, Linnell is off with our children to minister to them as well. So sorry about that. We're uh, it, just beginning a series on Titus, and we're doing something a little bit different, and that is uh, Titus continuously repeats this phrase for different categories of people that they are to be. He says that uh, Titus was left in Crete so he could appoint elders, and then he describes what an elder is to be. And then he says the older men are to be at the beginning of chapter 2, and the older women are to be, and the older men are to teach the younger men to be, and the older women are to teach the younger women to be, and servants are to be, and remind them to be, he says. And then the, the book ends as it's closing up. I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed God might be. So what we're going to do is we're going to... Um, overview a few sections, but we're really going to camp down on the various things that um, are challenged in the book, such as categories like marriage, and parenting, and finances, workplace, community. You may remember two weeks ago, Lyle was preaching. He says, I wish I could say more on marriage. And after the service, I said, you can. So uh, we're going to have Lyle, when I'm in the Philippines, Lyle will preach on, on marriage. Uh, there's also a number of subjects to be to be sensible, to be self-controlled, to be level-headed, to be loving, to be kind, and things not to be, to not be hot-tempered, to not be a bully, to not be a slanderer or a fighter or foolish or disobedient or envious or hateful. And so last week I began talking about uh, change, and we're going to finish that this morning. And last week I talked about uh, trying to make sense and trying to illustrate what I see as a paradigm of change. And uh, there is always um, a challenge in counseling to find the balance, and some would say there isn't a balance, um, between what I do and what God does. And I think um, in the past, there's been a lot of Christian counseling that has gone along the lines of just stop it. Um, and uh, if you want to see something funny, look up on the internet today, Bob Newhart, stop it. He's a counselor and he charges, if I remember, it's like $5 for one session. And when the person gives his problem, he just says, stop it. Um, not very practical, but sometimes that's the way Christian counseling was seen. And then there's been a shift, I think, in the last few years, maybe too far in the other direction to where it's all of God. And sometimes I hear counselors make statements, and my question would be, if it's all of God, then why are you telling the counselee to stop it when they can't stop it according to your definition of God doing the work? And there's this balance in there where God does a transforming work and an equipping work, and then ultimately I have to make the choice. And so if you look at this, this is what we covered last week, is everything begins with God. Everything starts with God. And even my intelligence and even when people speak of making a decision for Christ and, you know, whether they could figure it out on their own, uh, the very ability to do that would come from the creation of God in your life. There's nothing, Romans 4 says, that, that we have to offer or that we have to claim in the process of our salvation. The Word of God is given to equip us. It's everything God intends for us to know in this life. I could probably list a thousand things that I wish the Bible told us, and then I wouldn't be able to carry a Bible. You know, it'd be so big, um, it'd be in multiple volumes. But God has given us what He is find, what He says is necessary. For, Second Timothy says to equip us for every good work. So we have an equipping for 
good work. We talked about that last week. And then God creates a new nature. When I come to Christ, when I come to salvation, when I exchange my sinful nature and accept the free gift of Christ's good works and my sin is punished at the cross, when I enter into that transaction with God, the Bible says God makes us a new creation, that old things are passed away. But there still is the living the life and still growing to be like Christ. And so at this point then, we cross from what God does because I can't create a new nature in myself, that now I'm instructed that I need to abide in Christ. I need to remain. Um, I've listed it various times. Each writer in many of the books have different ways of explaining this. Jesus says in John 15, abide in, in him. But he also describes the idea of seeking, of knocking, of asking. Paul says this one thing and pressing on in Philippians 3. In Ephesians chapter uh, 6 or five, 5 and 6, when I go to the Philippines, I'm teaching the book of Ephesians. And we have this idea of putting off and putting on. There is this, this idea that I must stay connected to Christ. The uh, passage in John 15 is so amazing because the Bible says that God is the Father, that God the Father is the farmer, that Jesus is the vine, and that we are the branches. And so our fruitfulness, the, the expressions of our life, and I, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself of where I want to come in a few minutes, that is in keeping with Jesus, but that we are to remain connected to the vine as a branch if I want to see the expression of Christ in my life. So that's where I must make that choice of remaining close to Christ. And then ultimately, I make the choice. You know, it, in that moment, it feels very lonely because no one can make the choice for you. You can have counselors, you can have pastors, you can have family members, you can have best friends, and they can all give you counsel and instruction, and the Holy Spirit can equip you, and the Word of God can equip you, and the Holy Spirit empowers you, and, God, and Jesus calls you, but you must make the decision. Now, there are ways to help with that. It, it still is not making the decision, but there are guardrails, and guardrails are things that give me pause or cause me to have to take an extra step or two, so I have... I force myself to be reminded, I don't want to do this. Um, you know, I mentioned last week, my dad, I heard him say one time to take credit cards and freeze them in a block of ice. So if you're going to use one, you have to thaw at the block of ice. So that takes time and uh, gives you, uh, do I really want to do this? Uh, keeping a security lock on uh, TV or internet or keeping the computer in a place where you can be observed, whatever. And then there's accountability. And often misunderstood, people will say, my friend needs accountability, or my husband or my spouse needs accountability. But accountability only works when the person who is to be accountable desires accountability and will always be honest no matter what the cost. The minute, the moment that person lies or fudges the truth, the accountability is lost. And no one will know it but that person. And so accountability depends entirely upon that person being accountable to be able to fully answer and, and fully make themselves vulnerable to people. So along with that, I made the statement last week that our choices proclaim the priority of God in my life. When I am confronted by sin, and we're going to this week kind of include suffering because Suffering is a, is a time that I could doubt and question God or opportunities where there are things in my life that uh, is an opportunity to serve or to do something. Um, but in those moments, I am choosing between loving God and loving myself. I'm choosing between glorifying God and glorifying myself. Am I going to make a decision that brings honor and glory to God, an expression of love, or am I going to do what it is that I want to do? In fact, every opportunity, every temptation, and every suffering is my place to glorify God. Now, with Job, Job did not even know, as far as we can tell, anything about this fact 
that God and Satan had discussed him, and they were watching to see how he would respond. His audience was maybe two, two persons, Satan and God. When Johnny Erickson Tata, who was paralyzed from the neck down as a teenager, um, you can imagine having to face that. She was an athlete. She was, uh, you know, just had everything going for her, and now she was paralyzed. And one day, a young seminary student named Mike Estes was out um, raking leaves. He was a seminary student at Westminster in the Philadelphia area. And she said to him, why would God do this? And he says, I can answer that, but I don't think you're going to like the answer. And he said to her, because God has chosen that here you will bring glory to him. And if you know anything about her, she was mentioned this morning of, you know, passing out 175 to 200 wheelchairs. I mean, uh, she's equipping and touching the lives of people. I mean, when, when I started having my back problems, um, I read everything Johnny Erickson Tata wrote. It was such an encouragement. If you have anybody who's going through suffering, when she starts off books from a very dark place, sometimes you read books on suffering and they're fluffy. Um, I remember, re I couldn't tell you the name of the book right now, but reading about the getting ready to, her getting ready to speak, and she got a phone call, and it was a person in the hospital who had suffered. Well, I'll tell you what, what she said. She said that in the middle of the night, he, this man was paralyzed, and ants got in his feeding tube. Can you imagine? And I thought the first, first couple pages of the book, if she can speak to this, I'm going to trust this woman to speak to anything. She wasn't talking about a flat tire. She wasn't talking about uh, a broken bone or something like that. She was speaking to something that was unimaginable to me. And so this is that platform. And sometimes you're in a hospital room and nobody's watching. And sometimes you're in a place where many people are watching. We just don't know who the audience is. But we are, this is the place that I serve God. I, I proclaim to myself and to whomever that God is my choice. So what is God trying to do in my life? Well, he wants to make me like Christ. 1 Peter 2, 21, I could have chosen Romans 8, 28 and 29 where it says that all things work together for good to them are called by God and that God is trying to make us, in, God is making us into the image of his son, not trying to, he is making us into the image of his son. But I want to show you why I chose this passage. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example for you to follow in his steps. I've said many times that the Bible nowhere promises us anything but suffering in this life. I mean, there are wonderful times, and there are good times, and there are peaceful times, but the cross, take up your cross and follow me. We are continually, if we're going to become like Christ, the path to Christ-likeness is through trials, and it's through temptation, and it's, uh, it's not the easy path. We'll say more about that. Who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges rightly. And he, tr he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And we're going to say a lot more about dying to sin and living to righteousness. First, by his wounds we are healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. I chose that passage because of those last two names of God, shepherd and guardian. Think about that. The shepherd is the one who leads and provides and protects, and the same thing with the guardian. And the question that we have to ask is, do you trust the God of the universe in your life? And that was what that statement was to Johnny that day, do you trust God? Now, I don't know, there aren't many people that I know in my life that were faced with the loss of arms and legs. 
given that choice of trusting God, but it doesn't matter. It can be trusting God because it rains on my wedding day or my father's in the hospital on my wedding day or my wife's in the hospital, whatever it is. It's the full spectrum of things. Because we have to understand, is, Jesus, is God making me like Jesus or is he turning me into a spoiled brat? Now, to be honest, I would love to be a spoiled brat for God, right? Just give me lots of money and lots of health and lots of all of the things that I want. My, uh, my grandson, I spent the day with him Thursday. I also learned why you have kids when you're young, that even though I had a great time, I slept a full eight hours when we got home. And, uh, um, but we went, to, we went and bought an SD rocket that we're going to build and launch. And then he also thought he would like to get some Octonaut dolls, uh, whatever, you know, puppets or whatever. Well, I said, we can't. So we had this big, long discussion. So finally, I says, if you had a choice between a rocket and Octonauts, which would you choose? And he says, the rocket. And I said, so we made the right choice. You know, some point in time, maybe birthday, and he didn't want to wait till his birthday. He says, no, I think I'd rather have Octonauts now. Um, so we finally, I think, worked through it. But see, that's the choice we have to make with God is what do we want the most? And do you want to be like Christ? Now, it's easy sitting here in church, isn't it? Everybody knows the right answer to that. Do you want to be like Christ? Oh, absolutely, of course. Then we go out and we get on Route 9 and somebody's driving 40 miles an hour into town. Do I want to be like Christ? I face that every day of the summer. And sometimes I'm not like Christ. It's not without bursts of anger. Just I just have to work through it. It's like, uh, okay... Um, you see, when trouble comes into our life, what begins to happen? We begin to doubt the shepherd and the guardian. I can name a number of people in a 25-mile radius of right here that I've seen them post on Facebook, I cannot believe in a God who would. They don't comprehend a shepherd and a guardian that would allow difficult things into our life. Another thing that I want to say before I, before I try to bring this all together is the idea of baby Christians. Um, 1 Corinthians 3 is, is a passage that's always in my mind when, as I pastor and as I counsel because it begins with the fact that Paul calls them brothers and sisters. In other words, these are believers. But they're believers that aren't living like believers. And so Paul says, for my part, brothers and sisters, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people. In other words, they weren't spiritual people. They were brothers and sisters. Don't lose sight of that. But as people of flesh, as babes, babies in Christ, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, since you were not ready to, for it. In fact, you're still not ready because you're still worldly. For since there is envy and strife, have you ever seen those two words? You know where they show up? On the deeds of the flesh. They're the outworkings of the flesh. That's what I look like without Christ. When I was in the in Mexico, one time I was speaking on the fruit and being abiding in Christ and being attached to the vine. And I said, when we're attached to the vine, we bear Christ fruit. And when I'm not, I bear me fruit. And, you know, I could tell there was this little rumble. And afterwards, like 20 people rushed up because they were like, they thought they had learned wrong grammar. So I said, me fruit, not my fruit. And I meant fruit that looks like me. And I said, I think it makes sense in English. Maybe it, maybe it doesn't. But uh, um, does my fruit look like me or look like Jesus? If I get behind a person going 40 and start honking my horn and doing like this out of the window, that's me fruit. And just apply that across the board. And, and the Galatians uh, 5, the fruit of the Spirit, is not the only list in the Bible. There are many lists, but I find I rarely have to go anywhere else 
to say to somebody in your situation, in what happened in your home last night, do you find what you did on the deeds of the flesh, the works of the flesh, or do you find your, what your response in the fruit of the Spirit? You see, circumstances reveal the heart. Now, this is the most painful thing to come to terms with. Luke 6, Jesus is speaking, For no good tree which produces bad fruit, there is no good tree which produces bad fruit. On the other hand, a bad tree, there is no bad tree which produces good fruit, for a tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, no, they, they pick grapes from a briar patch. A good man, out of the treasures, the good treasures of his heart, brings forth what is good. An evil man, out of the evil treasures, brings forth what is evil. For the mouth speaks that which fills the heart. In other words, I remember uh, counseling a, a father with a anger problem and his he was laying on the couch and his son whacked him in the head with a wiffle ball bat and he said some very bad words when we talked about it what do you think why did he say those bad words what do you think his answer was well what did you expect in other words he he had such a hard time understanding that the wiffle ball bat just knocked the words out of his heart you know like think of a of a cup that's full and you shake it and what spills out. That's what Jesus is describing in multiple places. Mark 7, Matthew 12, Matthew 15. That this comes out of what's there. I'm going to speak on anger either next Sunday or the week after. And Jesus in the temple. I think it's one of the most misunderstood passages in the church. Because we interpret what Jesus did in the way I act when I'm angry. Do you think for a moment, I'll give you a little commercial. Do you think for one moment... That what Jesus did in any way was not everything found in the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, self-control? Do you think for one moment that Jesus was acting out the deeds of the flesh? Of course not. I'm not going to go beyond that because then I'll ruin my message. <laughs> but it's so hard for us. We want to blame the circumstances. But circumstances reveal my heart. I've said last week that if the circumstances are my problem, if it's my spouse, my boss, the weather, my salary, whatever it is, if that's the thing that causes me to not live the Christian life, then I have no hope. But if the problem is me, if the problem is that I'm not abiding, if the problem is that I'm not making the choice to, to live out the fruit of the Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit, then when I fail and I say it's because I chose not to, now I have a Savior. Now I have the God, creator of the universe, the shepherd and guardian of my soul. Now I have Jesus Christ who sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for me. And John says when we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And that he's the satisfaction for our sins. He says to God, I died for that sin. And we have the Holy Spirit to encourage us that Romans 8, God is my Father. So I'm either on my own if it's circumstances, but if it's me that needs help, I go to the Godhead and find all the help that I need. My brother, Dwight, I think it was 20, 26 years ago, he and a, another individual came up with this uh, cycle of change. It's just a very practical way of thinking through how we make choices. And so I took the notes. I, we were up in Canada, and, and I wrote everything down. And so I've been using it for all these years. And then Dwight spoke at the end, and I went and I found out that they added a whole bunch of cool stuff to it. And so when we get to where you see the word flesh and you see the word spirit, I, I just learned that this past week. But the cycle of change begins with a need. How am I not like Jesus? Every father dreams of his children growing up to be good workers. And, and so what we do through life is we, is we introduce things into their life 
that begin to discipline them and train them to be whatever it is, like to be a good worker. You know, I remember, I forget how old Matt was, but he was really young, and it was when you come home from school and you see the trash cans at the front, your job is to bring the trash, empty trash cans to the back and pick up all the trash around the area and put it in the cans. Okay? Okay, all smiles, it just was gonna be great. So he comes home from school and I go, hey Matt, the cans. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. So I look out, one can is halfway back. Matt, the cans. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And he brings the one can around. There's still two cans out front. Matt, the cans. Oh yeah, Dad. Out, you know the story. Matt, you're supposed to pick up the trash, and he trash around the cans. So he was. It stopped being fun real quick, right? And then my wife and I played good cop, bad cop. So uh, this time I was the bad cop, and I said, "Son, I'm just going to have to let you go." I'll just do the trash cans myself. And so the next week, I'm carrying the trash cans, and he's standing at the window crying, watching me do the trash cans. And my wife comes out, good cop, and says, I think you ought to give him another chance. I think you really would like. So we go in, and we sit down, and I said, Mom says you, you think you'd like to take back over the trash cans. He's going, yep. It's, it still wasn't perfect. But, but we're, in other words, why are we going through all of this? Why not just let him play whatever he wants to do? He's a little boy and just let him have fun because I want to grow him into be a, a man. And God wants to do that in our lives. So the need is going to determine the experience. That's why there are people that drive 40 on, the, on Route 9 just for me. <laughs> and there are long lines at tops just for me. And I go to the post office, and, I, and there's eight people, and I know them all. So I have eight conversations. It's just for me. I mean, that's a wonderful thing, but not when you're trying to get back onto something else next. But, or your son throws a baseball through the window, or you're falsely, whatever it is. There's no accidents with God. So I know that everything that comes into my life is somehow an appointment from God. And that produces tension. How will I respond? Will I respond with anger or envy or misuse of alcohol and drugs? Or will I argue? Or will I respond with love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, self-control? So then I examine how I responded. I have out in the foyer a thing I did when I went back to college and it was my sort of my bachelor's project. Um, on this very thing of taking what happened and examining the fruit, deeds of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. So then I come to a conclusion. Either I'm looking like Jesus or I'm not looking like Jesus. Now, I, I just use this illustration to, ex to explain when uh, one time, this is long, long time ago, 20 years ago, Ruthie and I were driving somewhere, and we got a flat tire, and I pulled the car over to the side of the road, got out, fixed the tire, got back in, and started driving. And she went, wow, you didn't get mad. So there was at least one time in my life that I can tell you about that I was like Jesus. So God stopped giving me flat tires. Not really. Then there's the application. So how am I going to work on this? What am I going to do? I'm going to involve myself in things like um, faith. We're going to talk about uh, Romans 6.11 in a moment, that I'm dead to sin, that I don't have to sin. I'm going to trust the Spirit of God's equipping that Second Peter says that I have all things pertaining to life and godliness. I'm going to put myself under the word. I'm going to bring myself and submit to the community of believers to assist me, confessing my sins to one another, as Romans says. And if I follow through with that, then we see change and maturity is evident. And the problem is that doesn't make me like Jesus yet. It just redefines the needs, whether we've got to go through another round of 
you know, like every summer I have to go through 40 mile an hour people. So they're just areas that God says, let's have a little fun with David this summer and uh, let's, uh, let's keep him going. And I, I say that as funny, but sometimes it's not funny. But you know what? It's not the person going 40 that's the problem. So, well, here's where Dwight put something up on the screen up at the end that I thought was, was wonderful. How does the flesh respond to these things? The flesh, when needs come in and something shakes, I want control. I want to control the circumstances of my life. I can't trust God to carry this out. And there are are some of us in this room that have a great problem with the control. You know, you can't trust God. Uh, you know, you have to s- somehow manipulate the circumstances and the people around you to get the outcome you think is important. So then the experience is a disruption. It's messing with my life. The tension is now anxiety. How do I get this to stop? Examination, how do I regain control? How do I bring this to an end? And then uh, the conclusion is my own understanding. Sometimes that understanding is forgetting that I have a shepherd and guardian of my soul. The application then to regain control. And what happens is my world begins to shrink to the size of me. In my experience. Versus the response of the spirit where I surrender to what God is doing. And I look at this experience as an opportunity to grow. And that tension creates a thirst. I want to be like Jesus. I really do. And so I want to respond to disappointments. I want to respond to annoyances the way Christ would respond. And so I ask the question, God, what are you doing in my life? What are you showing me? And just as when I would try to bring about growth in my children's lives, I want them to know why we're doing this. And God wants you to know there's not going to be any any ambiguity. The Holy Spirit of God is going to make certain that you know. And maybe, just maybe, if you don't know, then the answer is, is that God wants you just to trust Him in the silence. That happens a lot. I've gone through things in my life that I don't have an answer. I have counseled people that have gone through things that I find unimaginable. I find myself on my knees before God and saying, I, I, I can't hardly believe you allowed this to happen in this person's life. And what is God saying to me? You just got to trust me. I know what I'm doing. And one day when you stand before me, ask me, and probably when I stand before me, I won't need to. It won't even be important. So I hear the voice of God and I relax into his control. And then I begin to see growth in my life. Which then brings me to the place of, again, surrendering. We can apply this to outbursts of anger, envy. Where do I see myself? The the deeds of the flesh, there are little pieces that uh, just add, explain this, or my need for being a fighter or a bully. We'll talk more about that. But I wanted to quickly get to Romans 6.11. Romans 6.11, in my opinion, is one of the key verses, this in 1 Corinthians 10.13, which we'll look at next, in pointing out to me that these things are my choice. Because Romans 6.11 says that even so consider, the King James word is reckon, but it means to come to the conclusion yourself that you are dead to sin. You do not have to do it, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, we don't have a lot of time, but the Romans 6 begins after just speaking about grace in Romans 5, and so the conclusion about properly teaching grace is that we say, so it sounds like what you're saying is we should sin, Because where there's sin, there's grace. So let's sin so grace abounds. And Paul says, that's ridiculous because how can he who died to sin continue in it? It doesn't even make sense for a person who's dead to sin to sin. Verse 3 of Romans 6, do you not know 
that all of us who've been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death. Don't you know? And in, these, in this chapter, you keep seeing this word know and consider and come to a conclusion. Verse 4, you've been buried with him to the baptism of death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Romans 6, now because you've died to sin, you're alive to Christ and now walk like Christ. We have the freedom to walk like Christ. We become united with him in verse 5 in the likeness of his death. Certainly we will be like him in the likeness of his resurrection knowing that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. You don't have to sin. There's never a moment in my life that I have to sin. So the conclusion to that is, ready for this? Because this is hard to swallow. Every time I sin, it is because I chose to sin. That's where we find the Savior, the Helper, the Counselor. Now let me clear this up once and for all. The most amazing verse in the Bible when it comes to temptation. There's no temptation that's overtaken you. You are not unique. And though you may feel like you have it worse than anybody you know, that's not true. But such is this common demand. In other words, there's, no, there's not a single temptation in which everyone has not, or others have not walked through. And God is faithful. Now, this is the key phrase, because the faithfulness of God is at stake here. Think of this as being a document, a contract with God and the faithfulness of God is the nail that attaches that to the wall. That if ever you have a temptation, if ever you have a moment in your life where you say, I can't help it, and if that is true, you have proven that God is not faithful. You've disproven this verse, disproven the scripture. So it, it, it can't be. What does God's faithfulness ensure in that moment of trial? He will not allow you to, shepherd and guardian, to be tempted beyond what you are able. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. So what can you never say ever again? I couldn't help it. Because God will never allow it to be greater. Does that mean it's easy? No. What does Hebrews say? Have you... Have you shed blood in resisting sin? I mean, when somebody comes for counseling and they say they can't help it, I can give them lots of scenarios that they could help it. In other words, most of your sinning is in private. So cut down on the private time. Do whatever you can. I, I made a deal with a guy one time who had, who had trouble with looking at things on the Internet that he shouldn't do, and then he got a smartphone. He had, he, we, he had made himself accountable with his computer, and then he buys a smartphone. He says, maybe I shouldn't have done that. I said, well, here's the deal. Let's make a deal today. That the day you look at something inappropriate, you will take your smartphone and throw it as far out in screen like as you can. Deal? He didn't make the deal. Why? because he knew he shouldn't have the smartphone because he knew that that was going to create private time or whatever. It's not hard. I mean, it's not easy. It will take everything you have. That God has equipped you to the point where you must make that choice. Let's go on. But with the temptation, we'll provide a way of escape. Every temptation has a way of escape provided by God so that you will be able to endure it. The shepherd and guardian will never allow anything into your life that is more than you can handle. Please don't hear me that I'm saying everything will be easy. It will be sometimes feel like a bloodbath. But Christ died for that choice, Romans 6. Christ died for you so that you would be able to make that choice. And the shepherd and guardian in your life controls the circumstances 
to where when you are faced with that choice, you have been given everything pertaining to life and godliness. You have a new nature. You are abiding in Christ. You have a community of believers who have gathered around you. The Word of God equips you for, for uh, every good work. And so you stand there at the precipice of that moment and you make a decision, God or me. But you make the decision and God has given you everything you need and given me everything that I need to make that decision. So let me close with just a couple questions. How much do you want to be like Jesus? Have you ever heard the expression, don't pray for patience? Now, I know there's humor in that. But sometimes when I preach a message like this, I'll have people say, boy, it takes a lot of guts to preach a message like that. What's going to happen to you tomorrow? Do I trust the shepherd and guardian of my life if I want to be like Christ? Then I say, God, whatever it takes for me to be like Christ, I trust you. That's a scary thing to pray. But by faith, I take God at his word that he loves me, that I'm his creation, and he's going to change me into the image of Christ. I want to be Christ to you. I want to be Christ to our community. I want to be Christ to our family. So are you willing to allow God to work in your life? No matter what that demands. It's an old song, and I don't have the words in my notes, but if you want to hear some amazing lyrics, Larno Harris singing, When Praise Demands a Sacrifice, I'll Worship Even Then. Because the path of Christ likeness is tough. It's worse than tough. It demands everything of me because God is pruning me away, the me fruit. The experiences of my life are orchestrated by God. Do you believe that? Do you believe that every circumstance that you face is an appointment by God and a platform for you to glorify him in that place? And those choices reveal the priority of God in your life. So on that stage before God and whoever else God has watching us, our choices proclaim, I trust you, I love you. Let's pray. God, a message like this causes us to fear because we like life to be easy. We like life to make sense to our own understanding. And yet, you many times call us to a path that doesn't make sense. Father, it it doesn't make sense to my human reasoning that Paul's in the hospital the day of his daughter's wedding. And I could go on and on and on. And yet, here we are using it as an illustration of trusting the shepherd and guardian. And so there's glory in that. God, I pray for each person in this room, and I wish I could pray for each one by name, but you know each heart, each name, each face, that each of us, including myself, me first, would be so much aware of the facts that, first of all, I can make the choice, and second, that I do make the choice, that it is my choice, and third, Father, that we make the choice that brings honor and glory to you and continues to grow us in the image of Christ. We give you all glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us as we close singing Build My Life? Yeah.
upon your love it is a firm foundation and i will put my trust in you alone and i will not be shaken amen i pray that you would make that choice this week as we go out choose to put your your faith and trust in jesus christ build on that foundation and let's go have a fantastic week being the hands and feet of jesus to this community we'll see you next week No.